This conference and will now be recorded. And take it away, please. Thank you. Okay, well, so good afternoon, everybody. It's Friday. Thank you for giving up some of your lunch time with to spend some time with us. So I'd like to take you through the new model-based test course from the ISDQB. And the purpose of this is to enhance your knowledge from what you covered at foundation level into the idea behind using those te test techniques to actually design models. If you're designing a test model, then you need to, as I'm sure you're aware, work with the business analysts and developers to understand the requirements and then how it might be built. So one of the key things about this is that you hopefully will understand that in order to create an effective model, you need to be able to collaborate with the rest of the team. And those of you in Agile will already be doing that. Those of you not in Agile may not be so um, able to access the requirements people, but you will need to do that as part of this uh, understanding. Once you've got that, we need then to create and maintain the models. So we'll show you how to create those models using, some of you may have done UML. So the unified modeling language, we're going to use some of that to create models and I'll show you what the models would look like and hopefully very familiar for, to those of you who've already done the foundation course from the ISDQB. A key part of all of this, of course, is to make things better at the organization to support the QA process all the way through from the requirements capture process through to delivery to the end client. That's the sort of general idea behind this course. It is just a two-day course in line with the other specialist courses from the ICTP following up from the foundation course. So hopefully you will get a, you know, a power packed view over the couple of days. Okay. There's a lot of theory in these courses, as I'm sure you're aware. So what I thought I'd bring out is what the key three elements are. And if you remember from Bloom's taxonomy of learning, the key one was the recall, the key two was the explanation, and key three is the doing. So in this course, we have two days of learning and just about under under one day, five, five and a half hours. So in effect, a day would be spent developing and using these models. So it is quite practical in that sense. So what we're doing is showing you actually how to create models. And we've got some diagramming techniques to use for that. So you'll get some uh, cut down requirements from which you'd have to create models. And of course, we'll give you the model answers, uh, which will help you. And of course, for the exam as well. Once you've done that, we'll generate test cases. Obviously, it's a model-based testing course. So the purpose of the model is to facilitate us to design tests. So then we'll create those test cases. Once you've done that, we need to know, well, which tests do we need to select? What's that test selection criteria going to be? So do we want full decision coverage? Do we want boundary value coverage? What sort of things are we looking for? Now, that conversation will depend on what the end users might want and what you as a tester might think is necessary to deal with whatever risks are apparent at that particular time. Also, as we know, things change. So as things change, we need to update those models. So again, we'll give you practice at updating the model when a new requirement comes in or uh, a new requirement for what coverage levels need to be achieved comes in uh, as part of the uh, project. So that's the key three elements. There is an awful lot of theory behind it to fill up the other time and the other the sort of time of the course. And that is because we need to understand the background behind it, what sort of efficiency gains we might get. We need to understand the processes that we need to follow. So we will be covering to support that, not just the models we're going to be using, but other types of models. Now, some of you, again, may have done some work with UML, and UML is probably the most well-known diagramming uh, technology uh, techniques in, in, in the world and so we have class diagrams and they are generally used by the developers so they give us a view of the model so here we have a class diagram here and those of you familiar with that technology with that technique will see that we have a super class the vegan and then we have the the subsets of those classes bananas and chickpeas would come under vegan foods so you would have to model the system based on that information generally be generally used for the back-end databases um, and they normally sort of static models. So once you put them in there, of course, they're not going to behave in any way. You're simply going to access them. We have other kinds of models. And there's something called a sort of environmental models. There's something called a Markov chain, which looks at probability. So what's the probability of something happening now based on what happened before? So it doesn't require a, a particular starting state. It just says, what have we done now? And what, do, what can we sort of predict will happen based on what has just happened? 
We'll also look at test models because, of course, it is a testing course. So you can actually, from your model, then create a yet another model, which is a test model, to follow your model based on the design. And the reason for that would be that hopefully your test model follows your model, which follows the requirements, and then you start getting some traceability around that process. So those are the things we'll be covering. We look at in the modeling, so activity diagrams. Now, from the foundation, you may be relatively familiar with activity diagrams, or at least the format. We did these not as an activity diagram, but as flow diagrams. But if you look at this diagram here, we have activities shown in these rounded rectangles. Then we have the decision points. We also have the end nodes. Notice here in the foundation level, we just had one beginning and one end. Here, you could do the same, but to declutter the diagram, it could be sometimes useful to say when a process just simply ends. So it just helps everybody to understand the model. So we have here the activities, we have the, the, the decision boxes here. You could have another activity to inform you what the decision is, because the ultimate purpose of modeling is to allow it to be automated. So the more information, the more granular the decisions here that we make, and the information we put on, the better it becomes and the easier it becomes and less error prone it becomes to actually model it. As you're probably aware, we have to allow traceability. So if it's possible, we can add the requirements. But in the course, we have an example with 10 requirements to show you that, yes, it's an ideal, but in practice, it may end up being just a little bit unwieldy. But we will show you how this all works and how you can create these diagrams. So we won't be giving you the diagrams, we'll be asking you to create them yourselves based on the specs that we've created. So that's activity diagrams, possibly familiar to some of you. What will essentially be familiar to you is state transition diagrams, and hopefully you've all got the CTFL already. However, state transition diagrams here become state machines. So we've retained the title of state transition diagrams because we recognize people will mostly be coming up from the CTFL course. Here we, we retain the notation, so notice we now have states uh, as opposed to the other diagram where we had activities, now we have states. So the states here, we're moving through the system and we now have in the new CTFL the guard conditions, which we show here, and we have the requirements again for traceability. So subtly different, but not, not, not overly different from what you're familiar with. So hopefully a very short step up for you to actually now create the diagrams and understand the information from them. So what information do we want from them? Well, we want to understand when you're creating a model, does it follow the syntax rules? So for instance, the syntax rules would require guard conditions to be in square brackets so that the developer knows what we want. It would require us to use decision points to show where we have things, decisions on possibly later on you'll see some merge nodes. So we have potential ways of writing a diagram, creating a diagram, so that everybody understands. So syntax rules we'll look at. Semantics, so in English, semantics just means is it what we want, so is it valid? So we look at the validity of that model, because of course I could have something syntactically correct, but not really helpful. So if I wanted to model states, but for some reason, I end up with a class diagram, then it could be that it is syntactically correct, but of course, it's not going to suit my purpose. So we just need to be aware, and most people will be, but just to bring it out in a form, of course, so you have the underlying and underpinning theory to go forward that we understand how that's supposed to work. Then, of course, you're going to have to present this back because you will be creating these models as testers. You need to, create this, you need to, to present this back to your teams. So there are different ways of presenting information. If you're a developer, you may use a textual model, which is what you, you need for uh, if you're using pseudocode. Of course, if you are a business analyst, then you're unlikely to want that kind of presentation. So we'll look at the presentation mechanisms you might have available to you to present. And of course, this is just an example of a uh, coding presentation. You're probably already aware of this. You will select your test from the requirements you've been given. But also, having created a model, you may as well use the model to design your test. So if I have a state transition diagram, then I may want to model it. Again, you may be familiar with switch coverage, and we may want to look at that from the model, which would make sense. If you have created a data model, then clearly you'd be looking at the data associated with that, as we saw in the vegan foods example. What's been added here, because it's, it's modeling, you could have in performance testing a random model, because of course we don't necessarily know what the usage might be, so this allows us to possibly use the models to predict what potential 
usage profiles might look like. Those of you using user stories will know that we do a lot of testing based on scenarios. So we'll give you examples of creating use cases and then designing your model based on your use cases. In Agile, we know that one of the principles is that we must welcome change at any point, as late in the life cycle as is necessary. So we may find actually that all of these were academically and technically correct, but the project wants something different. So the model, if we were to match the requirements back to the model, then we allow our business people to drive differently. So they may say, actually, just focus on these now at this point in time, because it's more important for us at this point. So we need to be aware that the projects can jump in at any point. To give you comfort and familiarity, it's not going to look particularly different from what you did at Foundation. The difference now is, though, is you do need to be able to derive those tests from different models. You may not be familiar with pairwise testing, and that is when what we cover in the advanced course. You don't need it uh, specifically for the exam, but you do need to be aware that it exists as a way we can uh, derive our tests. But the course will and could, and the exam, ask you to assess coverage at all the others that you are already familiar with from the foundation level, but also we've added the activity coverage. So hopefully you should find that partic not particularly difficult in the course of, uh, and I indeed know in the exam. We bring out the difference between abstract and concrete test cases. Those of you doing CTFL post 2018 will know this already. Those of you not done it, we will cover the difference between an abstract high level test case. So for instance, I want to buy a book and a concrete test case, I need to say, well, with specific book. Okay, as you'll know as testers, you need to put the concrete data in there. However, the purpose of an abstract model is to facilitate understanding by all stakeholders they will not want the detail at the point of creation of creating the model. But in order to run a test, we need to have that concrete data in there. That then leads us to how we run the test. If it's manual, then of course we could add the concrete data as we go. If it's automated, you can't do that. You need to tell the program exactly what it needs to do. So we will cover those sorts of considerations that you need to think about if you're going down the model-based tester route. Again, familiarity, if you have done the CTFL, you will be familiar with keyword-driven and data-driven testing. These are techniques we can use to give us a semi-automated way of working so that the tester is not forced down the full automated route. So again, we can call on the developers to assist us and then give us some keywords and data-driven uh, and keywords to drive the data so that we can allow us creating the concrete data almost uh, automatic without having to have all of the, the, the technical skills required in the first place, just as we cover in the foundation course. When you're using model-based testing, it is, it is going to be key to everything else that we do. So we need to be aware that it will, of course, be part of our change and configuration management processes. We're going to effect change. We're going to find problems in those requirements. We're going to find problems in our models. We need to make sure we've covered those. It clearly has to impact the requirements engineering process because that's where it all begins. So we'll be working alongside these people to get this correct. And continuous integration, those of you in Agile will know that we have we rely an awful lot of automation for continuous integration. So now this model that we create in model-based testing has to somehow interact with that continuous integration process. So we need to find a way to do that so that this does not, the CI bit, the continuous integration bit does not move away from the model and vice versa. So there's quite a lot to consider when we are using this model-based testing process. And then to finish off, we just remind you that, of course, the model-based tool will fit in. When it gets automated, we'll have to fit in with the other tools that we have. So we have requirements management tools, which normally can form part of an entire application lifecycle management tool. But MBT now part, forms part of that whole ALM process. Okay, so we will we'll talk about those. I will talk about the test automation framework just very, very, very briefly, that in order to turn a, an abstract test case into a concrete test case, there has to be a test adaptation layer. So again, it's going to make you aware of the processes required to do all of that. So in this way, what we're hoping to do is open up your minds to taking more of the foundation um, information you got on test design and taking it up to a higher level to understand, well, the world is going automated. How do I take that journey with it? Because I think certainly we're seeing more and more, more and more 
uh, job adverts asking for, for automated testers. This begins that process of thinking about how am I going to do that? What skills am I going to need? Who am I going to call on? So, of course, you would then develop what you can do more. If we have more people getting more involved in automation, you have opportunity to do other things because, of course, one of the problems of automation is you reduce down the manual effort. And hopefully, if you go into this role with, with your organization behind you, because, of course, you can't do this on your own, the tools and the costs are actually quite, quite high, so the organization has to support you in this. Once you're doing that with them, then you begin a process of uh, increasing your value and reducing costs. And hopefully, overall for the organization, they will hold on to their stuff a bit more. Okay, well, that's a bit longer than I anticipated. Thank you so much for listening. Over to Bernard and questions then, really. Thanks, Anne, she's all very informative. Does, does anyone have any questions at the moment? Feel free to speak now if you do. Okay, I'm aware there have been some sound issues on this guy, so I apologize for that. However, this has been recorded and the sound will be perfect and we will send you a link to the recording on our website and on YouTube. So again, thanks so much for your attendance and uh, please please check out the course on our website. Um, you'll find CST training, RST group, model-based testing is there and ready to go. Thanks very much everybody and goodbye. Okay, thank you.